The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. And best-selling author Tom Standage has a new book out, and it's called Writing on the Wall. Tom Standage, what do Cicero and Twitter have in common? Well, the idea of the book is that social media is a very old idea. We think that it's recent and that only people alive today have ever done it. But really what I'm arguing is that there's a very long and rich tradition of social media that goes back, in fact, to the era of Cicero, the late Roman Republic. So that's the first century BC. And the point is that you don't need a digital network to do social media. It, if you have one, it goes faster. But you could actually do it in the old days. So Cicero did it with papyrus rolls and messengers running to and fro and other members of the Roman elite were all linked to him and uh, they all spoke to each other and it was very much a social environment. But there are then many other examples that occur throughout history. Martin Luther and his use of pamphlets, poetry in the Tudor court of Anne Boleyn, um, Tom Paine and his pamphlet Common Sense and, uh, and the way that uh, pamphlets were used more broadly in the run-up to the American and the French revolutions. So there are many, many examples and really what I'm arguing is that when we use social media today, it's a reversion actually to the way media operated for centuries centuries before us. You write that for wealthy Romans, the distinction between letter writing and conversation was further blurred by the custom of dictating outgoing letters to scribes and having incoming letters read aloud to them. Indeed. So if you were someone like Cicero or Julius Caesar, you would have a, a, a scribe. In fact, Cicero, um, sorry, Caesar was famous for being able to dictate two letters at once. Uh, so you would be dictating letters to them. Then you would also have a staff of messengers who would uh, be carrying these messages to your friends. And, um, and then when incoming messengers brought a scroll, um, your scribe would perhaps read it out to you. I mean, Romans like Cicero and Caesar were capable of reading and writing, but they got more done. They had higher bandwidth if they used scribes. And in fact, the role played by scribes and messengers, both of whom were slaves most of the time, um, is akin to the role that broadband plays for us today. The reason we can do social media on the scale we can is that it's very cheap and fast to copy and deliver information. And for the Romans, it was also cheap and fast because they had slavery. It was cheaper and faster than it had been before, and the Romans were a relatively literate society. So they were able to have this sort of social media ecosystem where they all passed messages to each other, sometimes several times a day, um, and it looks very familiar to uh, people who use Twitter and Facebook today. Uh, what were the wax tablets that you talk about? Yeah, so the Romans had these devices which look extraordinarily like modern iPads or smartphones. And uh, so if you were sending a message uh, within the city of Rome, then rather than using a, a, a piece of papyrus, uh, you might use a wax tablet, which was reusable. So um, it was a wooden frame and it had wax in the middle and you would scratch your message or your scribe would do it for you using a stylus. And then you would send this message by messenger across, um, across the city and the recipient would write their answer underneath and then it would be brought back to you. And uh, Cicero refers to this. It was sort of Roman texting. Um, and it was also uh, used as a notepad and people learnt to write using these things. So they look really a astonishingly like iPads. They're exactly the same size and shape as a modern iPad. It, there's even a sort of one inch wide frame around the outside. And there are also quite a lot of examples of Roman murals where people are depicted holding what look like, um, frankly, smartphones um, or those little smartphones that use styluses to, to write on. And uh, this is because they're using these very small wax tablets as notebooks. And so uh, it's one of these other unexpected connections between the way we do things today and the way the Romans did it 2,000 years ago. And Tom Standage, you talk about the fact that the Romans had their own LOLs, their own they short did. They also used a brief quite. They used abbreviations because um, they had, you know, not much space to write on these wax tablets or on a single piece of papyrus. Um, and if you wanted to write a longer letter, you could glue several pieces of papyrus together. But by and large, it was easier just to use one. So um, there was a premium on space, just as there is with a text message today um, or a, a tweet. So they used abbreviations. So one of them would be SPD, and that was um, sends greetings to. Uh, and there was another abbreviation that essentially meant, um, I'm well, I hope you're well, and if you are, that makes me happy. And you would just say that in four or five letters, and then you could get on with the, uh, the actual important part of the message. Um, so it's very similar to the way we use uh, you know, abbreviations BTW, LOL, and so on in tweets and in text today. Martin Luther, you write that Luther had unwittingly revealed the power of a decentralized 
person-to-person -person media system whose participants took care of distribution. So Luther is very interesting. He is obviously 15 centuries after, um, uh, after Cicero. Um, but initially what he does looks quite Roman. So Luther is a theologian in the town of Wittenberg and he thinks that the Catholic Church has got it wrong on the doctrine of indulgences. The church is essentially selling uh, these bits of paper that uh, get you out of purgatory earlier than you otherwise have to after you die. And um, they're selling these things to raise money uh, to fund the construction of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And Luther thinks this is a bit dodgy. Uh, this is fleecing the poor of their savings uh, in order to build this great big temple to the church. And um, so he thinks this is uh, unacceptable and he draws up a list of reasons why he disagrees with it, 95 of them in Latin, and he says, let's have a debate about this. Here are the things I think we should debate. And he pins this to the door of the church in Wittenberg, and um, that's how you announce a debate. The church door was the university notice board, and people read them and go, wow, this is hot stuff. So they start copying them down um, and sending them to their friends and discussing them, and, and, uh, and so far, so Roman. This is the same sort of thing. It's manuscript transmission of Latin text, but since the Roman period, Gutenberg has invented the printing press and a couple of printers get hold of this list and they go, wow, this is dynamite. People want to hear about this. So they print a thousand copies each and those thousand copies are taken to other towns and printers there print their own copies. And so the theses, the list of 95 um, reasons that are uh, things that Luther wants to debate, they spread throughout the whole of Germany within two weeks and they spread throughout the whole of Western Europe within four weeks. This is absolutely astonishing. Luther is amazed by this, so is everybody else. But Luther senses an opportunity. He realises that if he wants to take his message of reform to the public, he can have his message distributed in this way without really having to do very much. So he follows up with a series of pamphlets written in German rather than Latin, because that way more people will be able to understand them. And he writes in a very sort of straightforward German so that people in different parts of the German-speaking lands with different dialects will still be able to understand him and he gives the text to the printer in his town directly no money changes hands he just says here you go the printer prints a thousand copies they go to nearby towns the printers there go oh it's another one from Luther they print another thousand copies each and so on and so on and it ripples and Luther does this for several years he wages this campaign using pamphlets and preaching and other you know and woodcuts and other things as well but essentially he's using the fact that the printers and the audience are collectively amplifying his message because they're interested in what he has to say they're handling the distribution for him they're recommending it to their friends and if you have a message that people are interested in that people want to hear that people want to recommend to their friends then you can get this kind of viral spread and we recognize that today on the internet but that was what Martin Luther took advantage of in the 15 20s, and the result was the split in the church, the Reformation. Now, Mr. Standage, how does that differ what Martin Luther was doing from mass media? Well, the difference is that when you have a, uh, a social media system, whether it's today on the internet or whether it's in the old days <coughs> using <coughs> pamphlets or papyrus, um, a social media system is a two-way conversational environment in which people are passing stuff directly to and from their friends, so you're exchanging information along social networks, and um, that's why we call it social networking and social media. And, uh, and this, this creates a distributed discussion or community. So that's what a social environment looks like. And we're familiar with that on Facebook and Twitter, where we, we basically get stuff, we see stuff from people that we've followed. So it's, it's a lot of social network. The difference with mass media is that mass media is one way and it's impersonal and it's, uh, it's basically top-down broadcast. So um, it, the, the radio, for example, sits in the corner of the room. You're not, it's not social. It's just sitting there. You're not having a conversation with it. And there is no um, social networking or uh, personal recommendation involved. And so we have come to think of uh, these one-way mass media channels, which can reach a very large audience very efficiently. So newspapers, radio, TV, we've come to think of them as old media, as the way media always was and that the rise of the internet and social media is a change and it's unprecedented and now we can, you know, we can get news from our friends and, and you don't need to be a, a newspaper editor or a, the head of a TV channel to, to decide what message is going to spread. But actually this is how things worked in the, in the era before mass media. Mass media is a very recent invention. It really only gets going in the second half of the 19th century, so after the 1850s. And, um, and uh, we've come to see that period as the way media always was. But if you look before that, 
the period before old media, what I call the period of really old media, then actually it looks very, very familiar. It's social. It's social right the way from the Romans all the way up to um, the French Revolution, the American Revolution. And it's only after that that we get mass media. And so the thesis of the book is that um, social media uh, is a reversion to the way things used to be and that therefore we can learn from the old social media systems that came before. It turns out that many of the questions we have about social media today, its, it's impact on the, the quality of public discourse, um, whether it's a waste of time, can it start revolutions? These are all modern questions, but they all arose in the past for previous versions of social media as well. And that means that there are lessons we can, uh, we can learn today by looking at history. And in fact, you write in your chapter, Let Truth and Falsehood Grapple, you talk about uh, the year 1579 in England trying to restrict uh, some of these systems. Exactly. So it's a timeless problem. Today we understand that you know, when, when an embarrassing video or, or something like that gets out on the internet and people uh, try and take it down, you really can't do it with a distributed media environment where there's no centre. Um, it, there's just lots of interconnected things. Um, then you really, uh, it's very, very hard to control. And we see this um, after Luther, um, after he's, he's caused this uh, amazing split in the church with you know, extraordinary ramifications for, uh, for politics. In, um, and religion in Europe. Um, rulers across Europe think, oh dear, this, this printing press is bad news. We need to find a way to control this. And so they start imposing these controls on the press. They say that uh, you can't own a printing press unless you have a license from the government, that uh, all documents have to be checked by censors before they can be printed. But almost immediately, this system fails to, uh, to work, that there are clandestine presses, there are ways of getting around the licensing requirements. Um, you can do things like, um, when you're given a, a license to, to print something, you know, you have to say under license on the, you can just write under license on a, on a document anyway. You can list a completely different printer from the one who actually printed it or make one up. You can print under a pseudonym and it's then very hard for the authorities to figure out who has printed this document and to, to go and uh, punish them. So, uh, so you, you get this fight between the decentralised nature of the media environment and the desire to centralise and control it by governments, um, which we recognise as a, as a phenomenon of the, of the internet era, but it's actually going on um, in the 1500s. Tom Standage is a best-selling author, A History of the World in Six Glasses, and An Edible History of Humanity are his two latest books besides writing on the wall, which we're talking about with him now. What's your day job, Mr. Standage? I'm the digital editor at The Economist, so um, it's my job at The Economist magazine to work out how we should be best using digital platforms, and uh, part of that is what led to my interest in historical social media, because um, essentially we are returning to the way that things used to work, and The Economist came out of a sort of culture of, of coffee shop and pamphleteers and clubs and discussion. Um, and, uh, and so I think there's a lot we can learn for modern news organizations today by looking at history about how we should deal with the changes that are taking place in the media environment today. How did Tom Paine and, uh, contribute via social media to the American Revolution? Well, Tom Paine um, took advantage of a social media environment that had, in fact, been mostly constructed by Ben Franklin. So uh, Ben Franklin did two very important things. He was sort of the Mark Zuckerberg of the, uh, of the 18th century because he, he constructed a platform uh, for social discourse. Uh, the way he did it was he was a, a newspaper publisher, among many other things, of course, and um, he was also, uh, one of his many jobs was to be deputy postmaster general for the American colonies. So he greatly improved the efficiency and frequency of the postal service. That was the first thing. And then the second thing he did was he instituted a rule that newspaper publishers, such as himself, could use the postal service for free to deliver to their customers and also to exchange newspapers with editors of other newspapers in other towns. And at the time, newspapers were very, very small scale. They typically had a circulation of maybe 500 or 1,000 copies at most, and they were very local social platforms. If you look at what's in them, it's mostly letters from subscribers um, or speeches or reports of you know, funny happenings or stuff copied out of other the newspapers. There aren't professional journalists who are you know, attending things and writing reports. That all comes much, much later uh, in the era of mass media. So this is a very sort of social, local platform. And what um, Ben Franklin does by allowing newspapers to exchange copies with each other freely is he builds a system. Uh, he doesn't realize he's doing this, but he's just encouraging the, uh, the spread of information. And this is the system that Tom Paine and others are able to use in the run-up to the American Revolution to spread the idea that America should become independent from Great Britain. And uh, 
obviously Tom Paine writes his pamphlet Common Sense and it's distributed as a pamphlet but it's also one of the things and it's passed from person to person and recommended and copied just like happened with Luther's pamphlets but it's also printed and excerpted in the newspapers and then those newspapers spread to other towns and then people learn across this whole media environment about what Tom Paine has to say. Many papers actually printed his pamphlet Common Sense in full um, and so it was able to ripple uh, throughout the entire colonies and become extremely uh, widely known very, very quickly. So Ben Franklin kind of prepared the ground for it and Tom Paine and other writers in the, um, in the revolutionary period were able to use this system um, to spread the idea that independence was the, the way forward for America and of course that's what came to pass. Well, let's move forward in history a little bit. and Let's talk about the, the 1900s, 1920s, Guglielmo Marconi, and the rise of ham radio or amateur radio. So the really interesting thing about radio is that initially in its early years it too was a social medium. If you look at the uh, right at the beginning of the 20th <laughs> century um, there were enthusiasts who built radio sets and a radio set in those days was both a transmitter and a receiver and it couldn't do audio so you just had to do Morse code dots and dashes um, but this was promoted in the same way that sort of teaching your kids how to program today you know building building robots that kind of stuff which I like to do with my kids and, and part of the reason we do this is we think these are the sorts of skills that will be used Useful. Well, radio uh, was promoted as a way to improve your child because Marconi had made his fortune um, tinkering in his parents' attic. He invented this whole technology. And um, so if you wanted to sort of get, um, ride the wave of radio, the, the way to do it was to get your son a radio set and he would then le learn Morse code and he would, he would communicate with other people. And it was all great fun and it was all very social. The problem was as more and more people did it and as transmitters got more and more powerful, <coughs> the fact that they were all essentially operating on the same frequency because became a problem. The airwaves filled up. The Navy wanted to use this, but they kept being interrupted by boys who were playing tricks on them, saying, there's a sinking ship over here. And um, companies wanted to use it as well. When audio came in, they wanted to be able to do broadcasting. So what happens after the First World War is that um, radio goes from being a social medium to being an, a two-way medium, to being a very tightly controlled, regulated, one-way broadcast medium. And um, so this is interesting because it's quite you know, familiar looking and social to start with. You've got this sort of online chat room that everyone's in within a particular city with their, with their Morse code transmitters and receivers. Um, but then it goes from being absolutely from that to being absolutely the opposite of that and being a one-way broadcast channel that's not social at all. So radio is really the sort of interesting pivot here in this whole switchover from social to mass media that took place. And now we're pivoting back again from broadcast back into a more social media environment. And in fact, uh, you write that the Titanic uh, led to one of the first regulations of the airwaves. Why? Yes. Um, th well, this was because uh, this was a growing problem, the idea that uh, boys who were enthusiasts and they'd often built quite powerful transmitters and all of this was unregulated um, were starting to cause problems with things like um, rescuing uh, sink people from sinking ships and in fact it wasn't true that um, that the use of, of am the amateur radio uh, hampered the rescue effort but it was a very convenient story for the White Star Line immediately after the disaster because when the Titanic went down and the, the transmissions were, were underway it's a bit like when there's a sort of breaking news on, on Twitter like um, you know when Osama bin Laden was killed or something like that and everyone just everything goes nuts on Twitter um, it was the same the whole of the East Coast lit up with uh, radio transmitters with everyone saying have you heard what's going on and there was you know there was a certain amount of misinformation being passed around and um, it didn't actually in the end hamper the rescue effort because that was you know flawed for other reasons but it was very convenient for the owners of the Titanic to say well it would have been fine if it hadn't been for these ham radio guys and so in the first few days after the disaster they used that as their excuse and the, the White House calls a summit and says, OK, we need to sort this out. We need to regulate the use of radio. And that's the point at which, really, um, the shutters come down and radio ceases to be such a social medium. So the Titanic is, um, is really uh, involved in that, that switchover. And something uh, our viewers may find familiar, RCA in the 1920s had the tagline, World Wide Wireless. That's right, the, the WWW was their, their logo. Originally RCA was going to be a communications company. It was going to provide um, transatlantic telegraphy services and worldwide telegraphy services because up to that point telegraph messages, telegrams, were sent using wires. And um, radio meant that you no longer had to build this incredibly expensive um, network of wires all over the place. In theory you could, uh, you could have uh, just a few towers and, and so on. So RCA was originally set up to capitalize on that opportunity because Marconi, um, who 
who was European was, uh, was, and had set all this up in Britain, uh, was making great progress. And there was real concern that the British were going to end up with a monopoly on this business. So that was what RTA was originally set up to do. It, it then pivots to this uh, entertainment broadcast model in the 20s. And again, there's a very familiar debate, which is how do you pay for this? Um, initially, RCA does it by selling radios. So it's selling radios and then it's using the lure of free broadcast services, um, free content, to get people to buy the hardware. Um, but once everyone's bought the hardware, you're in a replacement cycle. Uh, it's a much less lucrative market. And so people start to wonder how, they, how they're going to do this. Are you going to have a tax on every radio, which is the model we ended up with in Britain, for example. You have, a, have to have a license to use the radio and you have to pay it to the government and then the government runs a government broadcaster, the BBC. Um, in America, that... Uh, that didn't go down terribly well and so advertising was proposed as a way of doing it and there was enormous opposition to this oh no you're going to clog up radio we're going to have to listen to ads it's just like how people reacted to the idea of advertising on the internet or advertising on twitter oh no they're going to muck up twitter or instagram oh they're going to have to, they're going to start having ads this is terrible this is exactly what happened with radio and of course advertising did come in and it turned out to be uh, the way that you sustain that model and uh, so we had soap operas and all, all the other sorts of things but it's a very familiar debate for those of us who use the internet today. October 29th, 1969. Bob Taylor, Charlie Klein, and Leonard Kleinrock. What happened? Uh, this is turning on the internet. Um, they didn't realize it at the time, but they were establishing the first link in what grew to become um, the modern internet. And uh, this was a, an experimental network at the time, and it didn't work. It crashed after two letters. So they were trying to type login. Um, they were at one end of the line, and I think they were trying to connect UCLA to Stanford. Um, they were trying to log into the remote machine over this network link that they'd built, and they typed L, and it worked. It came out at the other end. They typed O, and it worked. It came out at the other end. And as soon as they pressed G, the whole thing crashed. And then they had to try again half an hour later. So the first attempt to do an internet link actually didn't work. But subsequently, they got it working. And the internet starts off as ARPANET, this very small um, network. And it was essentially built to link together the various computers that were being used for military research purposes. And the guys at ARPA who were funding this had um, many of these computers that, that, they, that they had helped to uh, set up and that were being used. And they wanted to be able to see what was going on on them all. And they didn't want to have to have a remote terminal to every single um, machine around the country that ARPA work was being done on. They wanted to have a single terminal that could see all of them. And they also saw, and this is uh, again an interesting thing that seems to happen when you have computers that allow people to connect, they become inherently social communities. So users of a particular mainframe would be able to send messages to each other and you'd get more collaboration between the researchers because they could share their, their work. So the idea was if you connected lots of computers together you would get more collaboration. Now, of course we've seen that on a massive scale that the internet has fostered collaboration of all sorts, not just between military researchers uh, but between people in, in all sorts of different fields. And this is what makes the internet, you know, so, I think, powerful um, as a means of stimulating innovation and, and collaboration. It allows people and ideas who previously wouldn't have been able to come into contact with each other um, to meet. And uh, again, there's a historical parallel to this. That's exactly what coffee houses did in the 1600s. Um, so coffee houses had this rule that anyone could go into them as long as they bought a dish of coffee, which was a penny. Um, and that if you went into a coffee house, you were expected to be able to talk to anyone, regardless of social class. And this was a big deal in England in the 1670s or so. Um, but it means that you get these environments where, as one contemporary observer put it, <coughs> gentleman, lord, mechanic, and scoundrel all shall mix. And so you get people and ideas colliding that hadn't previously collided with each other. And this is you know, denounced by some people because it's such an alluring environment. You never know who you're going to meet and what you're going to find out. People end up spending hours in the coffee shop. Um, but it turns out to be extremely fertile um, as a sort of a hotbed of intellectual innovation. You get the scientists of um, the Rainbow Coffee House set up the Royal Society. And you know, Isaac Newton writes his great work, Principia Mathematica, in order to settle a coffee house argument about the nature of gravity. Uh, Lloyd's Coffee House turns into Lloyd's of London, the first insurance market. Jonathan's Coffee House turns into the London Stock Exchange. So coffee houses turned out to be this great place where you mix people and ideas up. And that's what the internet does by allowing people in different places uh, to meet virtually and uh, to exchange ideas. Tom Standage, when you look back to 1969, that first internet message, uh, to today, uh, the growth and the change in what we know as the internet, um, has it, is it faster than in the past? 
Yes, it's definitely faster. So I, I have to, you know, be straightforward about this. Modern social media is is obviously operates on a scale and at a speed that is unprecedented in history. So it's global, it's it's instant, it's searchable. It may be permanent. We don't know how permanent it is. That's sort of an open question at the moment. Um, so that is that is definitely unprecedented. But the idea that social media environments have never occurred before is not unprecedented. They have existed for many centuries. And even though there are these differences, the analogy is close enough that it's extremely informative. The sort of social reactions that you get to social media throughout the centuries, that it will trivialize debate, that it's a waste of time, that it will lead to revolutions, things like that, are exactly the sorts of issues that the internet and social media today have also raised. So the analogy isn't perfect, and there are obviously things you can do on the internet that you couldn't do with papyrus or wax tablets or pamphlets. But the similarities are close enough that we can learn an awful lot of lessons by looking at history. Mr. Standage, you write another possibility is that today's social platforms represent a transitional stage like AOL and CompuServe in the 1990s. Yeah, there's something quite striking about the way social media is operating on the internet today. If you look at the way email or web publishing work, they're based on distributed open standards. So if you don't like the idea that Google is looking after your mail, you can set up your own web server. I mean, it's a bit of a fiddle, but it is at least theoretically possible. You can set up your own web server that runs the open standards of the internet and plug it into the internet and it will just work. Similarly, if you don't want some company like Blogger or WordPress to host your, your blog uh, or whatever you're publishing on the internet, you can set up your own web server and plug it into the internet and it will work. So this is based on open standards. So if you look at the way social media is done, it's done in a centralized, siloed way and it's owned by large companies like Facebook and Twitter. This is very different. Um, it's not open standards based and distributed. Um, so I wonder whether that's a permanent state of affairs. This is, of course, just what happened with AOL and CompuServe in the 1990s. It looked as though they owned access to the consumer internet. And in fact, what ended up happening was that people People just bought um, straight uh, vanilla access, as it were, dial-up access, and they broadband access to the network itself, and um, and went on the web and used open standards. They didn't need these proprietary um, clients and proprietary client software that AOL and CompuServe provided them with. So I wonder whether Facebook and Twitter are the AOL and CompuServe um, in this. Uh, story and we'll see it playing out again. Now that said, it's actually quite a difficult um, computer science challenge to build a distributed social system that works in a timely manner. And we've, we know this because it used to exist, Usenet or Net News. If anyone was using the internet in the 1990s, they'll remember that. And essentially it was a social media discussion system uh, that was based on open standards. But it was uh, rather slow and it quickly became rather unwieldy. The uh, volume of traffic passing through it um, was really too big and a lot of ISPs didn't want to get involved with it. So there's clearly a, a lot of technical challenges that can be over, that would need to be overcome for this to happen. Um, but I'm keeping a very close eye on efforts like AppNet and Diaspora and Tent.io. There have been a whole bunch of them. Um, there seems to be a new one every few months to create an open standard for social media and social networking. And maybe just as AOL and CompuServe were swept away by the open standards of the web, the same could happen to Facebook and Twitter in the next decade. But whatever form social media takes in the future, you write, one thing is clear, it is not going away. As this book has argued, social media is not new. It has been around for centuries. Today, blogs are the new pamphlets. Microblogs and online social networks are the new coffee houses. Media sharing sites are the new commonplace books. They are all shared social platforms that enable ideas to travel from one person to another, rippling through networks of people connected by social bonds rather than having to squeeze through the privileged bottleneck of broadcast media. That said, Mr. Standage, social media, as you ask in here, has it coarsened and trivialized public discourse? What's your answer to that? Well, um, one man's trivialization is another man's democratization. So every time there's a technology that makes it easier for more people to publish stuff more easily, um, and this happened with the printing press, it happened with literacy, to be honest, and you know, writing, the alphabet did this, because before the alphabet, writing systems were very complicated and hard to learn. So every time there's a way um, for people to uh, for more people to publish, then the people who used to be in charge always complain that the wrong people will use this to say the wrong things. Um, so Erasmus, a contemporary of Luther's, says this. He can, he's very worried that because 
um, everyone is reading these pamphlets that Luther is writing. They're very short, they're very easy to read because they're in German. This means nobody's reading the classics anymore. No one's reading the Greek and Roman authors. He thinks this is terrible. It's a terrible coarsening of, of the intellectual debate. Um, and then, you know, we get this we get this time and time again. We get it with uh, with Twitter now that, you know, people say, oh, well, it's terrible. That anyone can say just anything. Um, but I think this is good. I think it's broadening access uh, for, of publishing uh, to more and more people. And uh, it's democratizing access to, pub, uh, to publishing. Now, clearly, what happens each time you have one of these expansions is that it initially appears to be completely unmanageable. And it takes some time to work out the mechanisms for sifting the stuff you really want to see from the, from the stuff you don't. And we saw this with printing. When the printing press made it much easier to publish books, there was an explosion of publishing. And um, people felt really overwhelmed. There were complaints of information over in the 1500s because of this. And if you look at what happened in the centuries after that, people came up with these technologies, these tools for dealing with it. Things like book reviews, tables of contents, um, indexes at the backs of books. What all of those things do is they enable you to work out which books might be relevant to you and which bits of them, which bit of a particular book is, uh, is the bit you're looking for. And so those were invented in order to make books more easy to navigate. And we're going through the same process with the internet now. We're right at the beginning of it. Initially we had Yahoo which had a sort of directory listing of the internet. Then we had search engines which let you put in keywords. Now we're using social to filter the stuff. We're getting our friends to recommend the interesting bits to us. In fact it's just the way the Romans did it. They had the uh, they relied on their friends to tell them the news um, when they were out of Rome to pass on the relevant bits. So using filtering the, everything through your friends and then filtering stuff f for them is uh, is where we're going next. So we're going to see hybrids between search and social. They're already starting to emerge. Um, so this is how we are dealing with the fact that lots and lots of stuff is being published and we don't want to read all of it. And um, this is how it happened in the past as well. So that's what I'm expecting to happen. The, the good thing, of course, is that what I regard as signal will be different from what you or anyone else regards as the signal. Um, and uh, these sorts of systems will allow us to pluck the particular things we want to read um, from this enormous churning ecosystem. Tom Standage is the author, Writing on the Wall, Social Media, The First 2,000 Years is the book. Thank you for being with us. This is The Communicators Thank on C-SPAN. C-SPAN, created by America's cable companies.